The following research is part of the National Institute for Congestion Reduction funded by the United States Department of Transportation through the University Transportation Center program. Learn more at www.nicr.usf.edu. Welcome to Out of My Lane, a podcast of the Center for Urban Transportation Research at the University of South Florida in Tampa. I'm Wayne Garcia, your host. Today, I am with Ms. Julie Bond and Dr. Aaron Schaffels. Ms. Bond is an expert in many transportation-related fields at Cutter. She has a master's in public administration from the University of South Florida, Go Bulls, and a BS in business administration from Southern Utah University. Dr. Schaffels is an ethnographic researcher, and in transportation, she focuses on discourse analysis. She has an MA in communication from Central Michigan University and a PhD in communication from the University of South Florida. Julian Aaron, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Pleasure to be here. Good. So uh, together, Ms. Bond and Dr. Schaffels uh, have published a project for Cutter in the Transportation Review Record in 2019. It looked at how the media uh, report on, uh, talk about uh, crashes involving bicyclists and in the wider world, pedestrians, bicyclists, all all of those uh, kind of things are their area of expertise. So today on this episode, we're going to look at the phenomenon in transportation of victim blaming and why language makes a big difference and what our discourse about crashes, even what we call them, crashes versus accidents, what that says about uh, what we know about transportation, how we understand it as uh, daily commuters and so forth. And that leads me to our wonderful little segment that we ask all of our first time guests to tell us about their daily commute. Um, Dr. Schaffels, let me start with you. What's your daily commute like? So I tend to drive to campus. Um, I live in Seminole Heights, and it just makes the most sense with time, et cetera, you know, deadline sorts of things. But I do like to walk in my neighborhood, so I have a pedestrian experience in that sense that has always been enlightening um, in terms of this research. So it's good to, I think, experience multiple modes. I have also spent some time biking in Tampa my bike is currently in disrepair, but um, I like to, you know, try on all the different modes. Uh, and although driving tends to be my first choice, the dominant mode. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Julie, uh, tell us about your commute. So I ride my bicycle to the campus when I do commute in, and I do telework, working from home a couple days a week. But when I do come to campus, I ride my bike. I live only about three and a half miles from campus. So it really isn't a a bad commute at all. It's I plan my route and we have showers at Cutter. And so um, it really is a great way to get to campus. In terms of commuting, uh, of course, uh, this is where most people uh, see crashes happen, uh, whether they're commuting to work or uh, traveling to the grocery store or whatever. And so uh, how did y'all get interested in this topic? There was uh, an ongoing conversation at Cutter that was pretty informal. We were looking at an article one day, like a group, a small group of us, and um, there was just this this sense to something being off, you know, or wrong. And... um, we, we did feel that it was as blaming the victim, but we didn't necessarily know why. And I, at the time, was taking a discourse analysis class and was learning the method. And it was the perfect opportunity to employ that method to see what is it that's off? You know, what is here? And so we can look at the text, the text itself without assuming anything about author intention uh, and determine what the text is doing by looking at the grammar, at the word choices, et cetera. And so we decided together 10 years of data um, and Julie helped to get connections to 
folks who tracked this stuff very methodically so that we had every single bike bicyclist fatality that was reported on in media for a decade's time span. And it just materialized slowly from just one of those conversations where you have this flash of, you know, insight or intuition. My background at Cutter um, has always involved bicyclist and pedestrian safety. And also um, as a bike bicyclist, I know many people in the community and our research revolved around bicyclist deaths in Hillsborough County. And so we looked, as Aaron said, at 10 years of bicyclist deaths. We actually mapped them out throughout Hillsborough County. And we then looked up all the media reports surrounding those deaths. Um, but this is, this is a topic I have much interest in. It's something that I'm currently working on. And uh, it's, it's something that means a lot to me. And so when Aaron and I started talking about this project, it just was something that really came together. And we've seen really great interest in this topic across the nation. So when we talk about victim blaming or a pedestrian or bicyclist blaming in uh, uh, serious and fatal crashes, wh what are we talking about? What, what are we looking for when you get this data? What are you um, picking out and saying, here it is? So in discourse analysis, uh, Norman Fairclough, who's one of the, you know, for lack of a better word, fathers of the discipline and methodology, um, talks about very simple linguistic strategies like passive and active structure and how that determines agency. Choosing a particular word, one word over another word, and how that shifts meaning. So we, you know, this is like the best method for this because we know it's a controversial topic. We know the blame word itself creates a blaming scenario where, you know, there's this person's fault or that person's fault um, or this group of people, right? And that's that's not the conversation that leads to a creative solution. It shuts down the problem solving process generally. And so discourse analysis is the thing where we can look at it and say, oh, here's what the, the language is doing. This is a cultural, you know, situation that we are immersed in just on a daily basis so deeply that we don't realize it's rhetoric and that we don't realize it has an impact on the way that we're viewing the world and ourselves in relation to others, and um, and in this case, victims of crashes that um, you know hopefully could could be avoided in the future if we start to talk about things differently, as if they're not inevitable, and move towards solutions rather than shutting down with the blame combo. Mm -hmm. So, can can you give some examples of? Um language, uh, rhetoric, discourse that uh, surrounding this in, ac in, in crashes, accident versus crash. There's one right mm -hmm. there. Um, uh, well, let's start with that one and yeah. then I'll ask you for some others. Uh, generally, I think we talk about, oh, there's a horrible accident on an interstate. Mm -hmm. We don't use the word crash as much. Well, why does that matter in terms of the language, not assessing blame, but the language? That language is really a matter of denotative meaning and connotative meaning. So thinking about the term accident and what's attached to that and the term crash and accident, the reason it's been criticized in the literature, I mean, Amy Cohen, who's a founder of Safe Streets, says, you know, our children didn't die in accidents. To say that would write off the truth of, of the matter and also say that there's nothing we could do to prevent this. Yeah, because accident... It at least is connotative to it's um, nobody's fault. It's just it happens. Yes. You know, yes. Act of nature or God, God's will, however you want to express it. Right. And so we don't want it to be inevitable, but we also don't want a conversation where it's like it's this specific person or group's fault. Right. So we're not we're not saying, oh, it's the media or, oh, it's you know law enforcement. We're saying collectively as a culture we have a responsibility to come together around the issue rather than being divisive and blaming one another where can we find common ground and so that starts with having the conversation about the word choice and what it means and what it would mean to a, a person who's lost a loved one in this way i think that in terms of uh, the angle of having empathy can also shift the way we think about it, like to put ourselves in like the position of having lost someone um, to traffic violence or a to a traffic crash. 
Mm-hmm. And, and we wouldn't want to call that an accident, you know, either. Yeah, because um, it seems to imply that, well, it's there's nothing we can do about it. Yeah, it's yeah. Just, the uh, accidents happen, right? Yeah, yes, um, exactly. Yeah. And, and even down to, like, as a longtime journalist myself, I mean, I remember and probably have written many uh, headlines and stories dealing with, you know, car jumps the curb and hits somebody mm-hmm. or a car does this. Uh, the headlines always attribute a crash to the vehicle mm-hmm. yes. and not to the driver yes. um, That uh, or other factors that we can do something about. Uh, are there some other examples that y'all can point to yeah. uh, uh, that really people will resonate with? That's a great one. The the car being the agent. That so that's one of the uh, results of passive sentence structure too. Is that it obscures agency. And so when the sentence is written in a passive structure, we have a little bit of confusion around who was the actor, who was doing what. Um, ex- instead, when we have an active sentence, it's very clear. The driver hit the bicyclist, right? The driver killed the bicyclist. It's an active statement, but we rarely see headlines or sentences within articles talking about the driver in that way. And the driver is very frequently replaced with the make and model of the vehicle. Yeah, and I think I think journalism struggles with that, you know, partially because, mm-hmm. uh, especially if let's say a driver hasn't been charged to blame them then, you know, then you start thinking mm-hmm. about libel. So it's mm-hmm. very easy because I can't libel a car. And yet it, it does obscure what has really occurred. It makes it, you know, this sort of um, lightning struck here out of the blue. And who would have guessed it? Yeah. And, yeah. you know, most of the articles we looked at were episodic in nature. So they were initial reports. And so they reported only on the incident. And at that point, we really don't know what happened. And so the reporting is coming from a police report. We really don't know what happened. There has not been an investigation yet. So those initial reports uh, tended to blame the bicyclist or the pedestrian. And we so we are saying that there shouldn't be blame on anyone at that point. They should just report what happened, but there should not be blame placed on anyone. And so most of the articles we found were episodic, and uh, some of the articles we looked at were thematic in that there might have been follow-up stories. And so they talked about, um, you know, what happened. They emphasized more about what happened, and they talked about family members and, you know, is there something they could do to change uh, how this occurred, if there was something we could do to change the infrastructure. So when we talk about this and we talk about our research, we don't want to blame anyone. We want to uh, look at what happened. We want to look at the at a public health angle. What can we do as a society, as a community to help to stop these deaths? And there are many things that we can do. Okay. So Let's talk a little bit about uh, the research that you all collaborated on in 2019, um, where you looked at all these things. So what did you find that uh, the public uh, can learn something from? So we found mostly that the structure of the sentence emphasizes the responsibility of the bicyclist with active structure and then the passive sentences de-emphasize responsibility for the driver. We also found that the word accident was still being used pretty frequently um, in spite of some momentum around shifting that terminology and in spite of changes to the AP guidelines. Um, And we also found that fact choices played a very big role in the process of understanding who is at fault or assessing responsibility as you're reading the article. And so when the article is episodic, Julie mentioned that as well. We looked at whether articles were episodic or thematic. Episodic articles are a who, what, when, where, why. It's a snapshot. It's a staff writer. You know, it's just breaking news. Yeah, breaking news in the moment. Here it is. Um, And that just leaves little opportunity for expansion. And when looking at the reports, what ends up in those uh, episodic impressions are fact choices about the bicyclist and what they did or did not do. So if they were wearing a helmet 
if they had lights on their bicycle, if they were wearing dark clothing, right? And we've heard this narrative in other contexts. And so we see that the choice of what facts to feature in that story also lend to a norm of victim blaming um, or the impression that the bicyclist is to blame. And I do this exercise with my students. I give them an article, an example article. It's a real one. Um, uh, and they look at it and get their impression and then assess it. And a lot of them from looking at it think that the bicyclist is at fault because especially since the first sentence is the bicyclist hits Mercedes yeah. driven by teen in Bell and yeah. Bluffs. Like that's the article title. Okay. Yeah. So they're like, well, he hit her. He hit her car, you know? And so just even that alone is... Um, in ways ignoring physics, right? <laughs> um, but also really shaping the reader's perception of what happened. And and so the the possible then effect of that is for people generally to think uh, these darn bicyclists, these darn pedestrians, they're you know it's their own fault. Yes, that they get into this. Yes. Yeah, and, and and that is what we're trying to solve. And so. Um, in some of the thematic stories we saw that were follow-up stories that could have been after the fact, um, you know, it, it changed, the narrative changed. And so it's interesting to see that as there might have been different types of um, investigations done, the narrative tended to change when, the, when other facts came out. Yeah, if it was a hit and run, the sentence structure when referring to the driver became active. Because we don't know who it is and they took off, so therefore we, we can blame them. Yeah. And with DUI, yes, that was, yeah. you could see a difference in, in the, the type of crash that, that occurred. Yeah. And, and yet, uh, all of those crashes are ultimately preventable at some level or, or another, whether it's the driver behavior or other factors that go into that crash. Did, did you see any examples? How, how much is the news media then following up with sort of solutions aimed at like they're okay. So maybe there's some ways to do something about this. I mean, some of them seem obvious. We just had a really big nasty crash on the Howard Franklin bridge here in Tampa Bay. And, uh, you know, I think some of the news reports talked about that the driver had looked down at their phone. We continue to say, okay, we have a problem with distracted driving, but a lot of these other things don't, they don't seem like they get sort of a follow-up ever in terms of like public health. I mean, if, if it's COVID or something's wrong, we're like, okay, how can we solve this? Uh, with crashes, it's like, they're going to happen. What the heck? Yeah, it's become accepted as inevitable, but we're, you know, kind of shining some light on that way of thinking and being and doing to attempt to save lives because no one should have to be on any end of that scenario, whether you're a bicyclist or a pedestrian or a driver. If this happens, regardless of what mode you're in when you're involved in it, it's traumatizing and devastating and will alter the course of the trajectory of your life. And so if we're all really thinking about that, then we shift away from this disidentification with the victim. Um, and yeah, part of that, when we talk about this in the, the learning management system we created, we have this way of being in the world. Uh, it's biased, it keeps us insulated and mentally protected. It's the belief in a just world hypothesis in psychology. The idea that if I do X, Y, and Z, you know, oh yeah, I ride my bike, but I wear a helmet and I have my lights and, you know, I, I follow the rules. And um, because of that, this won't happen to me, but that person wasn't doing that. And so when we go through the world in that way, we get a sense of security. It's a false sense though. Mm -hmm. And so we have to know that even if we do all those things that without protected bike lanes, without education, without understanding where hot spots and intersections are and all of that at the public level, then we're not making any headway. And, and if we're using language that is explicitly and implicitly blaming uh, or, you know, failing to account for one of the aspects of the crash, then uh, it seems to me that we're setting up 
a transportation system where some are more entitled to the system than others are entitled to the system. Absolutely. Yeah, it is a huge issue in terms of equity um, and income disparity and racial inequity. And so there are deeper systems of oppression embedded in traffic violence. And that's a part of educating the public as well. So uh, the outcome of this research, what have you uh, used it for and what can what can our listeners learn from it that would begin to make uh, the entire system and, and the equity of it all uh, better? What, what do we know from that? As a result of the research, yeah. um, we were fortunate to receive funding from the National Safety Council. And we did develop workshops that were, we actually held workshops for the media, for transportation professionals and also law enforcement. And so we held um, these workshops in several counties in Florida. And so the results of those workshops, um, we, we saw, you know, incremental change, I think, in, in the way media is following up. Um, we developed a virtual course and that is available now for anyone to take. And we'll put that info on, yes. the, on the website. And we've had hundreds of people across the nation take this course. And it's a really hot topic today. And so they're taking the course and um, it's really starting another uh, narrative. People are talking about it. I think they're understanding the importance. And some of the people I know here locally, because I do work um, out in the field for bicycle and pedestrian safety, and I'm seeing incremental change with the way the media is reporting. I'm seeing more thematic stories and it's really exciting to see that happening. So change has been happening since we did the research, then the workshops, and we'll continue to work with the media, transportation professionals and law enforcement, um, especially in our area here. And so I think you know there are really great things that are happening because of this project. So what's, what's the reaction of the folks who've taken the workshop? I mean, do you literally see this eye-opening reaction? Yes. Yeah, yeah, the the class is virtual, but we have a, an evaluation. And so uh, reading through the comments, um, you know, the comments are, are positive. Uh, many of them are saying, you know, we, we never thought of this. This is, is something that we're going to put into practice. And so really there is a practical application for this with uh, transportation professionals, you know, making sure that their language um, you know, is not victim blaming, making sure that it is helping to change our narrative. Yeah. And also I te when I teach my students, I bring this example in frequently in my professional writing class, we'll analyze an article and talk about this as a theme. And the reason that word choices and professional writing skills are so important, they have ethical implications. But when I see my students, you know, the illumination moment, like the mind blown, that moment, that's like, you know what what i do that's it everything, for. that's right? everything yeah. yeah and i saw that in the workshops even with law enforcement even with you know people who've been in their careers for 20 years like suddenly like oh you know it, you just see that as an excitement with a new worldview like a veil has lifted and you see that everything like with fresh eyes wow. yeah so where do you want to take this research next uh and and where do you want to take the public education component next I really am interested in doing more discourse analysis work, especially with forms. And when we started this um, project and began like looking at the inner workings of, you know, the process of getting from the police report to, you know, the PIO to the media, we were looking at actual report forms. And I thought doing an analysis on the form because so yeah yeah the things it asks and, yeah and doesn't ask exactly yes that would be an incredibly powerful uh next step that would require just me sitting with a form really um and wait still waiting on getting time to do that with the many irons i have in the yes, fire of course. but yes that is you know and in terms of like a research like 
more philosophical um, perspective, that would be my next step. And then I think with the public, like having this podcast, um, sharing this information with my students, uh, doing guest lectures and other classes about it. And we've done some news interviews and stuff too. It's like getting the conversation going and having people take this up um, with urgency and, and when they see that light is something that is continuing to evolve. And that's why I'm here today. Good. Yeah. Julie, what do you got going I'm on? I'm sure. Next? You know, one of my favorite programs here locally is a teen traffic safety education program. And that is locally funded by the Florida Department of Transportation. And so we go into high school driver's ed classes and we talk to teens about all types of different safety. And so, you know, this is this is something to start with teens. I mean, this is something to talk to them about and to help them understand. And I it, and I've seen there is an interest in this. So um, other other components, I'm out in the community working with transportation professionals, um, still giving presentations on this topic and getting people interested. Um, because again, I personally know people who have been affected by this. I know um, I have friends who are bicyclists that have been affected by this. So for me, it's really something I'm passionate about and I hope to just continue to take it even further and to really make change. Now, that sounds great. And I, you know, I think about my journalism research uh, colleagues out there, uh, especially those who uh, deal in the area of media effects. Uh, this sounds like a really rich area and I'm sure some work has been done, but um, you know, reach out and do some research with these folks that got some great data. Um, so uh, what is our benedictory message <laughs> to drivers, bicyclists, pedestrians, uh, from all of what you're looking at, what, what would you tell them now to think about as they're reading about, uh, crashes in their newspaper, social media, TV stations, whatever. My argument is to take multiple perspectives to, to be able to see the experience from the pedestrian's standpoint, from the bicyclist standpoint, from the driver's standpoint. Um, that's important for safety. For instance, if you're walking, knowing, you know, if you've made eye contact with the driver and they've acknowledged you and your presence, right? Like thinking about, did this driver see me rather than assuming? So just taking the driver's perspective, if you're walking, taking the bike or the pedestrian or the bicyclist perspective, if you're driving uh, is of equal importance and uh, being aware of this being a real problem and, you know, keeping your eyes on the road and all of that stuff. As a driver, you are in uh, behind a, a three ton piece of machinery. It's, it's a very dangerous thing to be driving, you know, 40, 45 miles an hour. And we take that for granted. So I think with great power comes great responsibility and thinking about that as a driver keeps me focused, you know, and hopefully it will help others to stay focused as well. But yeah, perspective taking and careful aware driving and I, I would just like to say i mean we're all just trying to get somewhere whether you're a motorist a bicyclist or a pedestrian we all have loved ones and so we need to have respect for everyone and uh, know that we all just want to get home safely and i think that's my biggest message that everyone has a loved one and everyone is important out on the road those are great thoughts. I really appreciate uh, you coming in today, uh, Dr. Aaron Sheffels and Julie Bond, uh, both working with the Center for Urban Transportation Research at the University of South Florida in Tampa. Uh, it is a very interdisciplinary field. And so you have people with a background in public administration and a background in discourse analysis, one in the English department, uh, so, it, it, and we've talked about this on a lot of the podcasts, this is not uh, strictly an engineering uh, issue or solution. Um, there's so many more aspects that go into it. Again, thank you for coming in. Thank you for everybody for listening to us, talking about why language matters when we talk about crashes, especially fatalities. Um, we'll be back uh, with our next episode of Out of My Lane. Look forward to seeing you at that time. I'm Wayne Garcia. Bye-bye, everyone.
National Institute for Congestion Reduction, NICR, is a transportation research center focused on innovative congestion strategies. The center is composed of researchers from the University of South Florida, the University of California, Berkeley, Texas A&M University, and the University of Puerto Rico at Mayaguez, and funded by the United States Department of Transportation. For more information, please visit www.nicr.usf.edu.